There were 12 of us to begin with, by Ian Gordon. With thanks to our producers, Ashley Lindsay, Robert Daniel Picard, Wes Sale, and Cameron Seegers. Chapter 12, Black Garden, December 13th, 2019. Richard Ike, a.k.a. Blue Bottle, leaned back in his chair, thoroughly exhausted, after detailing, as best his memory allowed, the traumatic events that transpired at the remote and isolated Miller's Manor some thirty years earlier. His interlocutor, the author, Annabel Franklin, poured each of them a glass of water, and patiently awaited the culmination of the survivor's account. "'The whiteout was disorientating,' he said, eyeballing Franklin. I lost Black Garden's prints almost immediately. Above the wail of the wind, I heard New Forest calling to me. Blue Bottle, she repeated, over and over. But soon enough, she was as lost to me as Black Garden. Franklin just listened, her thick-rimmed glasses perched on the edge of her nose. I must have been out there for twenty minutes, stumbling, screaming at the top of my voice. I felt like the last man on earth. He exhaled deeply, before continuing. Somehow, despite the blizzard, I found myself by the north wall of the manor. I skirted the perimeter in what I hoped was the direction of the kitchen door, and soon enough I found it and threw myself inside. I made my way into the reception hall, clumsily lit the fire, and sat there, shivering, half frozen to death. Ike paused, studying his left hand, the one upon which only a thumb and forefinger remained. I warmed myself by the fire what felt like forever— my eyes continually drawn to the shadowy corners of the reception hall, anticipating an attack from the killer, Longhorn. Franklin adjusted her glasses, watching the speaker closely. So engrossed was the author, that she'd neglected to add substantial portions of Ike's account to the hefty notebook on the table in front of her. But the house was silent, utterly dead, the survivor continued. I sat there, praying that Black Garden and New Forest would make it back inside, but— they never did. The man once known as Blue Bottle paused again, to take a well-earned sip of water from the glass in front of him. And it was about then that I noticed something, he continued. On the bureau along the north wall, I saw that a book had been placed there, a large book in green hardback. I knew instinctively that it was the guidebook, the crimes of the hypothetical somebody, but when exactly it had been placed there, I had no idea. I climbed to my feet, still shivering, and approached it. Sure enough, it was exactly what I suspected. And there, in the same handwriting, a new message had been left for whoever was unlucky enough to find it. Uh-huh, Franklin prompted, eagerly. It said, and I'm paraphrasing here, as you know, the book was never recovered, something like, and then there were two, who is it, me or you? Franklin, inspired, jotted the phrase down in her notebook. I read those words, Ike continued, and all of a sudden I just knew that I needed to get out of there, that the unnavigable terrain, the snowstorm, the cold, all of it would be preferable to an encounter with Longhorn. And so I took off, never looking back. Back out of the kitchen door I went, straight into the storm, and I just kept going, trudging through the snow with every ounce of strength I had left. Ike sighed, looking at his left hand once again. How I made it back to the A6 on foot, uh, I'll never know. Pure luck, I guess. If that plough hadn't been out so early the morning of the 5th, I, I would have surely frozen to death. And I guess you've got to be grateful for small mercies. <laughs> the frostbite was limited to my hands and feet. But you already know all that. Franklin nodded. Having listened with great interest to Ike's exclusive account, the author questioned him with regards to the subsequent police investigation. Well, again, as you know, he said, nobody had known I was up there. Nobody had any reason to question where I might be. I wasn't due to return to work till the 6th, and I lived alone. I was independent and stubborn. It, it wasn't unusual for me to go weeks on end without contacting my friends and family. This fact, though, coupled with my unlikely story, was met with a great deal of suspicion when I shared it with the police. 
Ike laughed emptily. But, sure enough, intrigued by the state I was in there in the hospital bed, they went out to Miller's Manor the same day, and it wasn't long before they were back at my side, scrutinizing me. Ike and Franklin went on to discuss the discovery of the bodies. The first body discovered by the police, as per Ike's directions, was the mutilated body of false widow, real name Maria Winter Botham, a forty-one-year-old environmental health officer from Derby. Investigators had been at a loss to comprehend the dedication and determination of a killer capable of severing the body at the waist with a pair of, albeit unusually sharp, garden shears. But what none of us had known at the time, Ike said on the subject, was that the poor woman's eyes had been gouged out, and her ears had been cut off, which of course suggested to me that there was a clue in there somewhere that we'd missed. Franklin nodded. The second, third, and fourth bodies to be discovered, again as per Ike's directions, were the frozen remains of Green Drake, a Mancunian man of Asian descent whose real name was Carkit Lee, the bloated form of Nightcrawler, a.k.a. William Clark, a thirty-two-year-old chef de party from Leeds, and White Admiral, real name Brian Gallagher, a forty-three-year-old warehouse operative from Sheffield. On the subject of Green Drake, Ike said, the discovery of the cup in Lee's en suite came as something of a shock. We'd all assumed he'd been poisoned at the dinner table. Ricin, wasn't it? Franklin proffered. A substantial amount, apparently. The partial toxicology report, leaked in late ninety, was, was very telling. Most of the victims had been poisoned in the first instance, and, in the cases of Lee and Gallagher, had been poisoned gradually. Gallagher's dreadful hangovers, it would seem, were due to more than just the booze. Makes you wonder what else was found in their systems. And yet, nothing was found in your system, Franklin added. Ike nodded, saying, I've pondered that mystery for years. The survivor proceeded to outline what he knew of the investigator's ensuing search of the outhouse, wherein the bodies of the fifth, sixth, and seventh victims were located. The Lancastrian stooge, Grey Dagger, real name Joanne Burton, a twenty-two-year-old aspiring actress, Yellow Jacket, a.k.a. Helen Ferguson, a housewife of thirty-three years from Salford, who had also, according to her husband, partaken in the event as a stooge, and the mustachioed Eastern European, Scarlet Darter, real name Art Chaklowski. Try as I might, Ike muttered, I'll never be able to get the image of the three of them planted there in the soil out of my head. They were on display, like a collector might have displayed them. Franklin nodded knowingly. The killer, according to official sources, had accessed the grisly barn by means of a shorter, less circuitous route than the one initially cleared by Ike and Co. A pair of cellar doors were located a mere stone's throw from the outhouse, to which the killer, with great effort, was able to drag the bodies of the victims through the snow and into the external building. Regarding the fates of the other contestants, Ike had only learned some weeks after his escape, when a number of officers and volunteers guided as they were by Ike's statements, had made an extensive search of the grounds and hills surrounding Miller's Manor. The eighth victim, it turned out, had been a victim of the storm. Andrina, who was revealed to be a fifty-seven-year-old copywriter from Nottingham by the name of Elizabeth Brooks, was found crouched beneath a lone tree some three hundred metres from the manor, wearing nothing but a nightgown. Exposure had killed her. I've always wondered what Longhorn made of Andrina's decision to walk out into the storm that night. In retrospect, having later learned of the Andrina mining bee, it seemed to me that Nightcrawler's death had implicated her. And then he added rhetorically, did she save Longhorn some work, or scupper her plans? The ninth body to be discovered belonged to Anthony Thomas, a.k.a. Black Garden, a twenty-seven-year-old bus driver from Utoxeter. Thomas had suffered from a blow to the head, concluded the medical examiner assigned to the case, and later, in his report, the coroner listed blunt force trauma as the cause of Thomas's death. As you're no doubt aware, Ike remarked, Thomas was discovered a mere stone's throw from the outhouse. It's uncanny, I must have run right by him. She was there, just outside, waiting to do away with two of us. Two of you? Franklin asked for clarification. Well, Yes, I confirmed. As per what was written in the guidebook when I returned to the manor, it was clear only one of us was meant to return from the outhouse. Franklin glanced at her notes. Do you have a theory as to the whereabouts of Longhorn? 
the author continued. Well, uh, as was revealed by the police during the course of their investigation, uh, again, as I'm sure you already know, the individual who arranged the event at Miller's Manor never actually met with the manor's proprietors. Jason Harrison, the booking agent, who acted on behalf of the anonymous host, was only ever able to offer one piece of information, that he spoke with a female over the telephone. And, as you know, the postal orders used to finance the event were never traced back to anybody. She was clever, that one. Left nothing to chance. And you suppose she's been in hiding all these years? Franklin asked. I wouldn't put anything past Longhorn, he answered. And New Forest? Franklin continued. Any idea what might have happened to her? She's a missing person, Ike stated. They never found her body. But if Thomas's fate is anything to go by, then Longhorn probably bludgeoned her to death and hid the body. Again, Franklin glanced at her notes, then asked, Strange that nothing found in either her or Longhorn's quarters afterwards shed any light on their identities, though, right? Yeah, Ike admitted. But then again, the same could be said of Art Chaklowski. If his body hadn't been recovered, there would have been very little to go on indeed. The subject of the twelfth guest was raised. The individual Ike had unwittingly replaced in stumbling upon the event that fateful night in 1989. Mark Jackson, Ike said. As you know, he was a suspect for a brief period. But, as was soon verified, he decided not to make the journey to Miller's Manor that afternoon. It would have been a long, snowy drive from Bangor. Yet, ironically, Franklin put in, Jackson died at the wheel in ninety-five, did he not? Yeah, Ike said. His brakes had been tampered with, apparently. And he shuddered, adding, I don't like to think about it. Franklin nodded sympathetically. Speaking of vehicles, she continued, do you have any thoughts regarding the missing cars? During their initial sweep of the crime scene, investigators had uncovered nine vehicles on the vast, snow-covered driveway. I could found this difficult to comprehend, as he'd been sure each of the contestants had driven themselves to the event. If so, three cars were unaccounted for, vehicles belonging to Longhorn, New Forest, and Scarlet Darter. Following the discovery and identification of Archaklowski's body, it was later verified that he had in fact driven to the event, and that his car wasn't among those found at Miller's Manor. As far as Chaklowski's car is concerned, Ike began, Longhorn must have moved it prior to my arrival, when the roads were still navigable. I think she probably planned to do something to the other cars, too, but once the storm took hold, she was spared the effort. There was no way in hell any of us were driving out of there. I mean, you must remember it. The Big Freeze of 1990, they called it. Franklin nodded. As for Longhorn and New Forest, Ike continued, I've always just assumed that they arrived by other means. It's impossible to know for sure. As the sole survivor of the Miller's Manor Massacre finished speaking, Annabel Franklin, the author in the thick-brimmed glasses, muttered something under her breath that both shocked and disturbed him. The words that left her lips were so devastating in what they implied that Richard Ike felt her phantom tingling in his missing extremities, and his body perceptibly shook for what she had said had thrust him back into the past, back into the confines of the oppressive Miller's Manor, the nightmare mansion in which he'd looked death in the eye and lived to tell the tale. The utterance had been this, fools and the foolish. And as his mind reeled from the import of those haunting woods, Annabel Franklin, in a manner quite unlike that of the first time Arthur Ike had met at his door early that December evening, eyeballed him intensely, and carefully removed the plain dust jacket covering the notebook on the table in front of her. Beneath that glossy camouflage had hidden, in plain sight, a very familiar book, a large book in green hardback, The Crimes of the Hypothetical Somebody. Ike wanted to ask where the author had found it, wanted to ask what it was doing in her possession, but he couldn't move, he couldn't speak, an all-consuming fear took possession of him. There, with the book open before her, Franklin flicked through its time-worn pages. Ike saw the provocative title, the illustration featuring the twelve guests surrounding the reading table in the library, and then caught some of the words sketched by the killer. Listen long and hear my song. We've met before, you and I. Perhaps I'm plain, ordinary, 
Who am I? Stranger to you all. Besides you, right now, you've a killer to catch. And as he read the words, and then there were two, who will it be, me or you? Franklin looked up at him, and removed her glasses. It was her. The killer. She'd come for him at last. But he couldn't move. Why couldn't he move? Then he looked at the glass on the table, the glass of ever so slightly cloudy water Franklin had so courteously poured for him. The author grinned, and in that grin he saw the truth. She was older now, of course, but that grin gave it all away, because he knew that grin well, had seen it more than once, and it didn't belong to Longhorn. He knew that for sure, for the two of them had spent just two brief days together. He could barely recall her face. Besides, the phrase fools and the foolish could be attributed to only one of the other contestants. Through lips that all but refused to open, Ike managed, It's you, New Forest. Smiling, the older and barely recognizable face of the lady once known to him as New Forest said, Congratulations, Blue Bottle. You caught me. And she glanced at the glass of water in front of him. Ike, just as he had stumbled upon murder at Miller's Manor three decades earlier, had unwittingly caught the killer in the act. The man bristled at the implications. Rising, the author collected the handbag that had lain beside her throughout the evening, and, slowly, approached the man she had so stealthily poisoned. What happened? To Longhorn, the dying man managed. Oh, you came close, the killer answered. Such a vast basement, wasn't it? The perfect place to conceal a disposable stooge. How freely they came, those stooges, how quietly they died. False walls, hidden rooms, never to be revealed. Longhorn was something of a loner. She left no record of her decision to attend murder at Miller's Manor. She's listed as a missing person up there in Manchester. Isn't it incredible that your description of the killer has never been linked to her? New Forest chuckled. The setup was executed perfectly, she continued, right up to the moment of Green Drake's death at the dinner table. Oh, the looks on your little faces when the man passed away. How the doubt established itself in that moment. The fear. Perfection. But why? Why us? Ike mumbled. You shouldn't have been there, Richard, she stated. But you were, and I'm glad you were. The others, well. Haven't you worked that out by now? And the blank stare the killer received in response answered her question. Willing prey, she said simply. And no, Andrina's decision to end it all didn't scupper a thing. We each of us have our triggers, Richard. I... I don't... I don't understand, the ailing man murmured. Imagine a life, Richard, she continued. The life of a quiet lady, hurt by many, completely forgotten so afraid of the world at large that she grows to fear it, to hate it. She turns to the mini-beasts, the butterflies, the spiders, the beetles, the worms, collects them, controls them. She discovers the new forest cicada, in whose existence her own is beautifully reflected, and, deifying it, mimics the cicada, crowning herself queen of the mini-beasts. But she's mean to those beneath her, spiteful and cruel. She taunts them tortures them, swats them dead. And it isn't enough. It's never enough. Do you know why? With great effort, Richard Ike shook his head. Because the mini-beasts aren't responsible for the pain she feels. The real bugs and critters are out there in the so-called civilized world. The ones who scuttle past her on the street without so much as a hello. The ones who crawl over her on the road and in the supermarkets the ones who meet her gaze with glazed-over eyes, the ones who neglect to acknowledge her very existence. The maniacal lady bared her teeth and hissed. You are no different, Richard. She crept closer to her motionless victim, her eyes fixed upon his. But what? Why the game? Why so elaborate a game? Ike croaked. With the exception of you, the murderer returned, I'd played with them before. A new forest had played with them before. Alongside a much younger and considerably less anxious White Admiral, a.k.a. Brian Gallagher, 
that boiled at the boiler room 74 in Sheffield, with a twenty-something false widow, a.k.a. Maria Winterbotham, at Last Standing Lincoln, July 1975, beside Nightcrawler, a.k.a. William Clark, in the messy Scars of Scarborough event of 1978, alongside Andrina, a.k.a. Elizabeth Brooks, at Monsters at Montague Castle, in Cambria, November 1979, with the ever-enthusiastic Green Drake, a.k.a. Carkett Lee, attending Who Done It at the Pumpkin House in October 1980, among a group that included Longhorn, whose real identity as Alison Gill would forever be New Forest Secret, at Middleton Mingling, July 1981, with the brooding Black Garden, a.k.a. Anthony Thomas, at the Southport Slashes event of 1984, alongside Yellow Jacket, a.k.a. Helen Ferguson, at Bolton's annual Burn the Goose event, January 1983, in the company of Scarlet Darter, a.k.a. Art Chaklowski, at the all-nighter Grantham Gamshoes 84, as a fellow stooge with Grey Dagger, a.k.a. Joanne Burton, at Buxton Manor's Halloween Haunting of 85, with the would-be Blue Bottle, a.k.a. Mark Jackson, at Who Killed Who in Cardiff, June 1986. Overnight friends who promised to call, short-term lovers who promised her love. But they'd all forgotten about her. They'd failed to recognize her upon their reunion at the manor, which, despite the incredible length she'd gone to in order to bring them together, was confirmation of what the troubled lady already knew to be true. She was invisible. She could go anywhere, do anything. She was forgettable, like the washing of one's hands. She was the hypothetical somebody, the one who didn't exist. Thirty years later, it had taken a stranger, an accidental man, to identify her, to solve the mystery of murder at Miller's Manor. Liars, cheaters, backstabbers, all of them, she yelled. In hosting murder at Miller's Manor, I was able, just as I had done with the mini-beasts, to taunt, torture, and swat those who had wronged me, wronged the Queen— Reaching into the handbag she carried, Annabel Franklin, a.k.a. New Forest, produced a crown of thorns, a dreadful metal garland beset with jagged, rusty nails, each of which pointed downwards, a trophy designed with two purposes in mind. But you caught me, Richard, caught me in the act, saw me, acknowledged me, made me actual again, and for that you will be rewarded. And as the demented woman lifted the crown above his head, she began to sing. It was a song she'd sung many times before, a terrible tune for those men and women who had poisoned her with their lies and unfulfilled promises. The melody soared above Richard Ike's motionless head in microtonal, dissonant waves, shrieks and hisses akin to the night song of insects, the chirping of crickets, the singing of cicadas. Listen long! And hear my song, the killer wailed. With extraordinary force, the crown was thrust atop Richard Ike's head, with the desired result. I crown you victor, Blue Bottle. He lived long enough to hear the lady's parting words. You will have pride of place in the new Black Garden. And thank you for joining us for our third 12 Days of Christmas special, folks. We've really enjoyed reading your comments along the way. Some of you were definitely onto the killer very early on in the game, despite the red herrings dropped left, right, and center. The complete recording will hit Bandcamp and Patreon midweek, followed by YouTube on Friday the 10th. Again, thanks for sticking with us for this one, guys. We couldn't have done it without your support. If you've enjoyed these specials over the years, and even if you haven't, let us know below. And stay tuned for a return to regular output as of January 13th. And until then, may the poor haunted soul of Blue Bottle be with you. <laughs>